I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3. This is the next to last uh, sermon in this series. And guess what? We're going to be able to say that once again, we have finished, completed an entire book of the Bible. Praise the Lord. We're getting there. One book at a time. Uh, and in five years, we'll get done with Job on Wednesday nights, and uh, we'll be able to count that one on the list, too. Uh, no, Job is just a long 40-something chapter, so it takes a little while to get through a book like that, uh, but it's been a great study. And it's been amazing to me at how closely related Habakkuk and Job is in what's going on and how they see the pain and suffering and things that are going on in their life and in their world uh, at that time. And so we're going to talk about today uh, quietly waiting. Quietly waiting. Or some would say patiently waiting. Uh, but Habakkuk uses the word quietly. I'm, I'm going to quietly wait. How many of you, when you're anticipating something, I mean, you just can't wait. You can't, can't stand it. How many of you quietly wait or how many of you are like my wife who uh, can't wait to get her birthday present what is it can you give me a hint can you tell me what it is well honey you're not going to get it until your birthday well I know but can't you give me just a little something give me a little something she doesn't quietly wait for her birthday uh, she loves to ask questions. Um, and Habakkuk, we're going to get to that. Um, and Habakkuk is not necessarily quiet, but we'll see at the end where that kind of comes into focus. I want to read the first uh, two verses because uh, verse number two is actually where the meat of the text is really going to come from. And so let's read verses one and two. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shigianoth. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. And in wrath, remember mercy. You see, out of this passage of Scripture, I think that that verse 2 is the most important verse, not that we're going to say that all of them are not important, it's all God's word, but it's more important for us to help us to understand the rest of what he is saying here in these first 16 verses of this um, chapter. And so he makes three statements in verse 2, in the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. And then he changes it a little bit and says, In wrath, remember mercy. You know, I wonder many times, you've probably wondered the same thing. I wonder if we, in some sense, are experiencing God's wrath on earth even today. I, I wonder if in some of our families or people that we know, neighbors, friends, whoever it is, maybe in certain nations around the world, and I wouldn't exclude ours, uh, but maybe God is, in some sense, pouring out his wrath in certain ways. And now this is not the wrath that is to come. We're not talking about the, the end times wrath, uh, the, where he's pouring out the cup of wrath upon uh, all of mankind that's left. Uh, no, I'm not talking about that, but I, I think and I wonder, is God doing that in our day? Are we experiencing, maybe even right now, and I'm not getting into the politics of it, but what I am going to say is I wonder if we're reaping what we've sowed with our economy right now. I wonder. I don't know. I can't verify that. I can't 
I can't say that God is the cause or he's allowing this to happen for a purpose. I, I, I can't say that necessarily. Uh, but I do believe that God is in control. I believe that everything is sifted through his fingers. Uh, nothing's going to happen unless he has allowed it to happen. Uh, and so I believe that God uh, may be he's pouring out his wrath. And, and here's the thing. My hope is, is that if he's pouring out wrath, that he doesn't forget his mercy. If he's pouring out his wrath, I hope that he doesn't forget that. Because guess what? I've got family, loved ones, friends who are going to die apart from Jesus. They're going to die apart from God the Father eternally if he were to stop things right now. If he were to remove his sustaining hand, I would have people that I know and I love who will spend eternity apart from God himself. And so as much as we, we want wrath in one sense, we want wrath to come upon those who are doing evil. At the same time, I hope that he remembers his mercy at the same time. He was a merciful God to let me go from 12 years old to 23 years old thinking that I was safe in the arms of Jesus when I was nothing more than a lost sinner who had just been dunked in some water and had said some words that didn't mean anything in my heart at the age of 12. I am thankful that he let me live another 11 years. That to me is his mercy because he could have poured out his wrath. I didn't have to make it to 23 years old. But praise the Lord, I did. So we're going to break down uh, verse 2, and we're going to break it down somewhat through the rest of the chapter. And so I'm going to give you point one. You've got your uh, bulletin uh, sermon outline there, uh, so you can fill those things in as we go along. I didn't use a lot of outside verses today, to be honest with you. Uh, I was not planning on having... Uh, it, it, as much time as I am to preach today. Uh, it was going to be a very shortened version of this. And so you're not going to have a whole lot of extra stuff. We're going to come straight from the passage today. Uh, so the first point is God revive your work. God revive your work. This is Habakkuk basically asking God to revive what he has done. He is asking God that he would revive the work that he's known about in the past uh, in response to the tragedy that Habakkuk has seen that will be happening when the Babylonian army will wreak havoc on God's people. So he's asking them, revive your work. Revive what you've done in other times, in other ages, for other people, in other situations. God, you've been at work since the beginning of time. Now it doesn't seem like God is doing a whole lot. What has Habakkuk seen? He's seen God give him this vision showing him that the Babylonian army is going to come in and just wreck things. They're going to tear the Israelites apart. I mean, they're going to come in and just tear it all up. So he's thinking, wow, God, why aren't you intervening? Why aren't you working? So he's asking God to revive his work. He doesn't understand why God seems to be allowing this to happen while he sits back and watches. In chapter 2, of course... God had told Habakkuk, though, that the Babylonians would pay for the tragedy they cause. We talked about that last time. We talked about how God spoke to Habakkuk. He says, even though I'm going to use this army, it doesn't mean that they're going to get off scot-free. Nowhere in the scripture, and God has done this multiple times, Nowhere in the scripture has God used evil people to bring about good to God's people and yet they not suffer the wrath of God later on. What did he do? He used people who were already evil. They already had it on their hearts to do evil. These people were going to wreak havoc no matter what. The Babylonian army didn't start with the Israelites. The Babylonian army had been going around wreaking havoc everywhere they went. They'd go in and they'd destroy a village. They would destroy a town. They would kill everybody in it. 
set them on fire. I mean, this Babylonian army was, was mean to the core. But God said, don't worry about them because they're going to pay for what they've done. They still have to answer to God himself. So that's the first point. The second point, I think, is, is really big. Uh, the second point is God remind your people. God remind your people. How many of you today need to be reminded of what God has done for you in the past? Anybody? Have any, any of you struggled, suffered? And, and what you need is to remember what he's already done? But what do we do? We get stuck in our circumstances. We, we get stuck in the pain, the disappointment, the grief, uh, all of this stuff. We get stuck there and we forget what God's done in the past. As a matter of fact, we go through certain things and we think, oh, there is just no helping us now. There is nothing that's going to change this situation. I've got to fix this. I've got to step up and I've got to do something. And yet I fail over and over and over again. And, and I get to this point where it's like, I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't know how to fix anything. I don't, I don't know what's going on. And it's almost like the Holy Spirit of God, just kind of in a brief moment, goes, well, what about me? What about me? You've been trying to fix it for some time. But what about me? You've failed over and over and over again. But what about me? Did you forget the fact that I saved you in the beginning? Do not neglect the day of salvation. Do not get over your salvation. That's easy for us to do, by the way. I've had many people I've known in my life in churches, been in church for years and years and years, had a salvation experience 30, 40, 50 years ago, and yet they live as though nothing has ever changed. They're not evil, but they, they just live as though God is not important anymore. And what's happened is they've gotten over their salvation. They've forgotten what God has done in their life. And then when things start to happen, when, when you've got Joe, a Joe Rhodes that goes down this path of struggle and sickness and, and you watch that, it is easy to get caught up in that moment and to forget all that God did before. But hey, at the funeral here, we were reminded what God had done through Job's, Joe's life. Right? I think the family needed to be reminded of that. They needed to be reminded. Of how I stood outside afterwards and I talked to the chief of Fletcher Fire Department and I'd heard a story and I was like man I got to hear this from him himself about how Joe saved his life he was like 15 years old got on in a motorcycle accident and Joe comes up and punctures into his lung because he's drowning on his own blood he punctures his lung and this comes out and he saves this guy who is now the chief of the Fletcher Fire Department saves his life Man, I wish that would have been said right here. Because I'm telling you what, it got me excited. And I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know when it came around the first time. I had never even heard the story. But man, I tell you what, it matters to be reminded of what God has done in our lives. What is Habakkuk doing? Saying, hey, remind in the midst of war, pain, and loss, it's easy to forget what God has done. So God, uh, Habakkuk, excuse me, <laughs> not that God needs to be reminded, but Habakkuk reminds God of what he's done in these next verses. Let's go to verse 3. God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Listen, as you go through this, you need to understand that every single one of these is a story of how God has worked in their lives in the past. This one, the scholars believe that this was him talking about God leading the Israelites to the promised land. 
based off of where Teman and Mount Paran and all that is. He's reminding God. Hey, God, remember when you led the Israelites to the promised land? Remember when you did this? Remember all that you brought them through? Remember how stiff-necked they were? And yet you you left a remnant. There was a remnant that remained. And there were people who actually made their promised land. God, do you remember that? I, I need you to remember that, God. Because we need it again. We need you to work again. So you need to remember this. Well, he just stopped there. Verse 4. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. This was the Shekinah glory of God when God presented himself as a cloud. The lights are flashing from the cloud. God is leading. We know that God was in the front. He moves to the back. He, he moves. He's in the front to begin with saying, hey, follow me. And then when the army's coming up behind him, the cloud moves to the back to stand in between to protect them from the ones who are coming. Habakkuk, once again, God, remember what you've done. Verse 5 through 7. Verses 5 through 7. Before him went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of cushion in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. What is this? The plagues of Egypt. This is the plagues of Egypt. And what did he do? What was the purpose in that? Let my people go. Wasn't that what Moses said? But yet, initially, it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Later on, it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. The reality was is Pharaoh's heart was already hardened well before all this began. He was already an evil man doing evil things. And they had taken the Israelites into captivity and they were working them like a dog. I mean, working them to the the bone. But God said, I'm going to bring upon them these plagues. And if you'll listen to me, Israelites, if you'll listen to me, my wrath will not be poured out on you. Because that's exactly what the plagues were. It was God's wrath being poured out on an evil people. But he told the Israelites, if you don't do what I tell you to do, you'll also suffer. So we get through the plagues of Egypt. Let's go through 8 through 10 verses. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea? When you rode on your horses, on your chariot of salvation, you stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows, Selah. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging water swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. What was this? The parting of the Red Sea. What is it talking about? Well, what did Moses have to do in, in order for the sea to be parted? Anybody remember? Had to hold it up, right? He, he was holding it up. Now, he didn't cause the sea to part, but God told him he had a part to do in order for this to happen. So he held it up. The seas parted. The people crossed on dry land. But what does it say? The Egyptian army is coming behind them. I mean, they're they're catching up. I can imagine, we're talking about millions of people, by the way. The, the, The exodus was millions of people crossing over the sea on dry land with a wall of water on both sides of them. I can just imagine. I would be scared to death that this water is going to come down on me. Scared to death. But not only that am I scared of the water, but I hear the roar. I hear the rumble of the chariots coming with the horses. I hear these soldiers yelling, screaming, Oh, I'm coming. You know, I'm coming. I'm going to take you out. But what does it say God did? He let them cross over to dry land. And then he, 
All the water came down. What did it say it happened to them? Every one of them drowned in the deep. You see, that's the God we serve. But in His wrath, He remembered His mercy when the Israelites came to the other side. They were saved in that moment. Well, He doesn't stop there. Verses 11 through 13. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. Now this comes out of Joshua 10. This was as the Amorites fled from the Jewish armies. God struck many of the soldiers down with hailstones. And it also said that Joshua prayed for the sun and moon to stand still. And God granted his request. Wow. In his wrath, God remembered his mercy. Then he goes on. Second half of verse 13 and 14 says, You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. Selah. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. This was David's victory over Goliath. He was considered the head of the house of the wicked. What did David say? Who are you to come against the armies of the Lord? He shouted out across there when everyone else was scared. The Philistines had already said, look, we're going to bring out our biggest guy, our strongest warrior, and you don't have anybody that can stand face to face with him. And when everybody cowered in the corner, little David, little shepherd boy David, who could play the harp, didn't sound like such a a manly man, but man, he stepped up and he said, all right, give me the armor. He was too little to even carry it. He, He wasn't even prepared for what was going on. But I tell you what, he had protected the sheep. He had killed animals that were coming after the sheep. He was a smart guy. But more importantly, he knew that he represented the God of the universe. He knew that he was going to stand there in this place and God had it all under control. And what did he do? He slew the giant. But he didn't just stop there. What did he end up doing at the very end? He went up to him, took his own sword, and lopped off his head to make a point. God is in control. God is in control. Verse 15. The, Nobody, including myself, knows really what this was referring to, but it says you trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. I I tried to research that quite a bit because I really wanted to know where that was coming from. And, and, And nobody seems to know. That's okay. Because he can trample the sea with his horses and the surging of mighty waters anytime he wants to. We know that if Jesus can speak and calm the sea, then we know that he can trample over him if he chooses to. We know that if he can step out of the boat if he wanted to and walk on water or walk from the seashore and come out to the boat or anywhere else he wants to be, if he can do that, walking on water, man, he is in charge. He can do whatever he wants to do. And so we see from that verse 2, God, revive your work. God, remind your people. And then we get to the third one. God, remember your mercy. God, remember your mercy. Verse 16 says this, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet, I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. You know, I think through this process, 
that we've seen in the first 15 verses. Habakkuk is speaking to God and asking him to revive his work and to remember his mercy and, and all these things. He's doing that. But I think what really happened is that all of those things shored up Habakkuk's heart. All of that reminded him who God is. It reminded him of what God has done. It reminded him of all that he knew about, even if he wasn't alive. He had heard all the stories of everything that had come before. I mean, those things would have been told from generation to generation. Written down in books. Passed along from person to person. But even Habakkuk needed to be reminded. And when he was, what does he say at the very end? Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. You see, he could have, but Habakkuk didn't turn his back on God. And notice that he also didn't try to gather an army to fight against the Babylonian army. He also didn't try uh, to warn everyone to flee from the pain that is to come. What, what would you have done? Man, if I knew that there's an army that's getting ready to come, I mean, I just know this. There's this army that's coming to attack, to attack us. I'm going to tell everybody that I can, you need to get ready. I'm going to tell everybody I can, run for the hills. They'll be running right here, won't they? Run for the hills. Come on up here to the mountains. I would be telling everybody, hey, gather up. Get your tools. Get your uh, weapons. Get your ammunition. Get all your stuff together. Because, man, we're going to need it. Because we've got to battle the Babylonian army. Man, they are going to come and they're going to try to wreck us. But, man, if we, we, if we just stick together, if we come together and get all of our stuff together, man, we'll fight them off. He doesn't do any of that. What does he do? He says, God, I'll wait on you to fight our battles. I'll wait on you to avenge the evil. I'll trust you to do what only you can do. How about you? Are you willing to wait on God through whatever it is that you're going through? Are you willing to wait on God? When you're not getting the answers that you want, are you willing to wait on God? Are you willing to endure the pain that you're going through knowing that there is coming a day where there will be no more pain? Are you willing to wait on God? What does God say throughout His Scripture? Over and over again, wait on me. I'll fight your battles. I'll be there for you. I'll go before you and I'll come up behind you. I'll be above you and I'll be below you. And I'll be in the midst of you all along the way. What does he also say? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Vengeance is mine. When you've got people coming at you from all angles and they're not nice people and all they want to do is tear you down, our first response is typically, I want to fight back. I want to shut them down. I want to give them a taste of their own medicine. But what does God's word say? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Even when Jesus came onto the scene on the earth, uh, people were looking to him like, hey, you know, shouldn't we do what the law says? Shouldn't we go out here and, and stone these people and kill these people and all those kinds of things? But what does he do? He says, if somebody smacks you on one cheek, you turn to the other. How many times should we forgive someone? Seven times? He says, no, 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 70 times 7. For you math majors out there, it's 490. But listen, that's not even what he's getting at. He's saying you forgive. 
and then you forgive again. And then when you don't even want to forgive again, do it one more time. Then he says, if somebody takes your outer garment, what are you supposed to do? Give them the cloak as well. If he says, you are going to go a mile with me. If a soldier were to come up to you and say, hey, you're going to go this mile with me, what do you do? You give them one more. One more. You increase by one. I, I love that. I, for some reason, that's been in my mind here recently. Just increase by, if we would all just increase by one. Read the Bible one more time a week. Pray one more time a week. Attend the worship service one more time a week. Whatever it is, if we would just increase by one, wow, how much of a difference that would make in our lives. And understand that God is in control. I'm going to ask you to pray with me and then we're going to sing a song as we head out of here. God, we are here and we are placing our faith in you. Because to be honest, we have no one else to place our faith in because everyone else fails. And you have never failed. While the world seems to plot and rage against you and your commands, there are people here who are standing for you. We do ask you to revive the work that you've done in the past. And we need your Holy Spirit to remind us of all that you've done for us already. We know that your wrath will only be restrained for a time. So please, please remember your mercy. There are many more, many, many more who need to find salvation in you. And so Lord, we pray for your mercy and giving them time to find it. As much as we want you to come back, we also want to see our friends, our family, our, our neighbors, and everyone else spend eternity in heaven with us. So God, help us to patiently wait on you. And Lord, as Habakkuk said, God, help us to quietly wait on you. And I know what that means. It means that the reason why he's quiet is because he is trusting. He doesn't need to argue. He doesn't need to fuss. He doesn't need to constantly question you. Let us place our faith in you. After all, you've been more than patient with us. God, we ask you to help us now as we leave here. To keep our eyes and our hearts focused on you that we would not neglect the day of our salvation, that we would remember uh, the first time when, when you saved our souls. Help us to remember that day and then help us to remember every other miracle and, and great thing that you've done in our lives since then. And God, especially when we are going through struggles, remind us of what you've done before because we know you can do it again. It's so God, help us to be who you have called us to be. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask.